Hey, Ronnie. Hey, Lou. How you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. You know, I host this show on the radio here in Sacramento on 101.5 K-Hits called the K-Hits Garage. I've heard it once or twice. And we talk a lot about cars. And uh, I had an email that I got earlier this week, and someone asked me if they should pull or disconnect the battery cable to find out if their alternator is uh, working and charging or not. Mm. Is You think that's a good idea? Because on this episode, we're going to tell you some of the things you should never, ever do to your car. And men should know this stuff, Ronnie. Right. Of course, I know you will. I do. And I will. Yes. So you better watch. Well, I can't wait to get to it. But we'll, oh, let's do it right after this. Hi there, I'm Lou Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. Welcome to another episode of Men Are So Smart. Today, men on cars and uh, 10 things you should never do to your car. Number one, Ronnie, never overfill the tires to get better gas mileage. What? Yeah, uh, the internet is brimming with testimonials from people who claim they upped their mileage simply by inflating tires to the maximum pressure listed on the sidewall. Oh, this is so wrong. It's not a good idea. What they don't tell you about is the rougher ride, yep. premature tire wear, yep. longer stopping distances, and increased repair cost breaks due to worn out suspension and various components. The recommended tire pressure for your car is listed on a placard inside the driver's door and it's based on vehicle weight along with the best possible handling. Inflating your tires to the maximum pressure listed on the tire is okay if you're hauling a very heavy load. Right. Going to the dump, let's say. But you must reduce the tire pressure to the recommended pressure once you remove the load. Driving a normal load on overinflated tires reduces rolling resistance which affects your gas mileage, and oh, well, that's what it says, and that can increase your mileage. Right. right now, you also have to remember that most times when you're checking the air, it should be done cold. Oh, in the morning. Right. So once you've driven to a gas station, it's going to be off a little bit. It's going to be a little bit higher than what it really is when it's cold. Now, what's nice if you're a homeowner versus, say, an apartment dweller, uh, is to have a mini compressor in your garage. Yep. I have one of those. That, it's not for blowing up tractor trailer tires, right? But yeah. it'll certainly take care of what I need for the tires in my car, and I recommend those. And, and Ronnie, what are those? About seventy bucks? Yeah, for about seventy dollars. You can get one, and I have one right over there that does the same thing. And, and then you go out in the morning before you go to work a few minutes early, and you test the tires, right? And you put uh, air in accordingly. Yeah. So on our list today, uh, do not overinflate, and for that matter, do not underinflate your tires to the recommended pressure yep all right this, this next one uh -huh. a little a little controversial perhaps all right let's take it on never use the wrong coolant slash antifreeze okay uh, i'll save my rebuttal to the end I exactly and i have one also whether you do your own cooling system flushes or just topping off your cooling system after repair using the right coolant is critical to the life of your car's engine and cooling system components uh, the recommended coolant for your car is listed in your owner's manual if you use the wrong coolant or mix two different types of coolant, you can actually cause early water pump, radiator, heater pipes, and heater core failure. It's because corrosion inhibitors are designed to be compatible with the specific metals used in the engine and cooling system. Each inhibitor package also has to be compatible with the types of plastic and rubbers used in seals, gaskets, tubes used in your particular engine. If you mix coolants, the corrosion inhibitors in one type of coolant can be incompatible with the additive pack package of the coolant already in your car. All right, let's go, let's start. First of all, uh, as it pertains to that paragraph, uh, number one, if you are changing your own antifreeze slash coolant, it's the same thing, okay? Antifreeze coolant, same thing. Uh, if you're changing yourself and you have pets in your household, you need to be so yeah. extremely careful about how you're draining that because uh, it, it, it will kill animals uh, and, yeah. and very quickly yeah. uh, should they drink that. Okay, so that's number one. Uh, Ronnie, you want to take number two? 
Well, and I, I think this has been kind of a little bit debunked because if you're using a major brand, and I'll say this, uh, a major brand antifreeze. Prestone. Uh, Summit. Uh, What's that blue one? Oh, can't remember. We used to sell that all. Yeah, so. I can't remember Peak. either. Peak. Peak. There's there's probably like three three major, four major brands. They're compatible with everything. Uh, and they do that on purpose so that they can literally go in any car. I know for a while, uh, Prestone had two different colors. I think they had the, you know, the kind of the fluorescent green. And then they also made the red one. Same exact formula. That was a long time ago. Yeah, that was that was a while back. But they did it just so that people wouldn't freak out. And they go in and they tell the guy, hey, I've got red antifreeze in my car now. Okay, well, here's Prestone Red. Uh -huh. So Same stuff. Now just it's all the color. same. Yeah. Uh, As a look on the bottle, it'll tell you right there. All right. makes, all models, all colors. Exactly. So you literally can't go wrong. And, and now we break it down two ways. There's also uh, pre-mixed which is diluted right. to a 50-50 mixture, uh, and then there's straight antifreeze. Right. Um, you know what I do is I put the bottle in, and then I fill, and I put some in the overflow first, Right. Uh, and then I fill the radiator, and whatever is left, I fill with water. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to lie to you and say I use distilled water. Yeah. I I'm going to probably use tap water. Unless distilled water comes out of my hose. <laughs> yeah. Ron, yours is distilled, Ronnie. I think here in Orangevale, you people do have. Uh, anyway, so there you go. It's it's really a bunch of crap. Oh, and I will tell you this, though. Antifreeze is actually designed to work with a 50-50 mixture. So if you're not, if you're saying, well, it's if it works you know, good... With a 50-50 mixer, it'll work better. It'll work better, 100. Yeah, percent no, no. It does not work that way. No, and that's see, that's where I get my 50-50 mixture is when I pour in the gallon, I mix it into the overflow uh, t uh, tank, and then fill the rest with water. And, and to me, that's enough or close enough to a 50-50 mix. All, All right. right. So we move on now to never mix up brake fluid and power steering fluid. A one pint <sighs> bottle of power steering fluid looks almost like a one pint bottle of brake fluid. True. Yep. That's why, and, and they can both be yellow because yeah. Prestone makes those as well. Yep. That's why so many DIYers mix them up. It happens more often than you think, or maybe the label comes off and you don't know. Oh, boy. If you add a, the wrong fluid to either your power steering or brake system, the repair is going gonna, is gonna to be very costly. Catastrophic. Probably over a 1000 bucks. Uh, power steering fluid swells the seals in a brake system, causing total brake failure. Have you seen that commercial where the guy comes into the shop and he says to the mechanic, Hey, you guys any good at brakes? And the guy goes, yeah, we're pretty good. And the customer goes, only pretty good? And the guy goes, we have this saying around here. If the brakes don't stop, stop it, something else will. <laughs> He's got a point. <laughs> yeah. To fix the mistake, the shop has to rebuild or replace the master cylinder, calipers, wheel cylinders, proportioning valve, etc. Sometimes they even have to replace expensive ABS equipment. Pouring brake fluid into your power steering reservoir is just as damaging because brake fluid is not, is not a lubricant. No. So it causes pump and power steering gear failure. Always double check before you refill your brake or power steering fluid reservoirs. Yep. Yeah, and well, and also if you happen to get some, uh, your brake lines also get coated with that power steering fluid, they will probably have to use quite a bit of new brake fluid to, to rinse to that get out. get all that out of the brake lines. Oh, even. yeah. So it, it, it's, oh, it's a, that's a thousand dollars, Ron. Yeah, that's a hot, hot mess right there. Uh, next, never use, uh, use a universal fluid in your power steering or transmission. Uh, several fluid manufacturers claim their universal power steering and transmission fluids work in all car makes and models. The car makers disagree and their arguments against using universal fluids are based on incompatible specifications, not greed. For example, there is simply no single transmission or power steering fluid that can meet the many different and some are mutually exclusive uh, additive requirements for every transmission and power steering system in use today. 
Uh, in fact, European, Japanese, and domestic car makers have differing transmissions and power steering fluid requirements from model to model and even year to year. The recommended fluid for your car's transmission and power steering fluid is listed in your owner's manual. So I was, at this point, probably what you're saying is, what's an owner's manual? <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you bought the car used, it's a crapshoot whether it's in the glove yeah, box yeah, or not. But yeah. uh, so I did 27 years part time at a Honda dealership, and people would bring their cars in all the time, and their power steering was making noise, and they go through and they look at it, and they're like, uh, "This is not Honda power steering fluid in here." I'm like, no, it just uh, it's actually Dexron too. Like, that's transmission fluid, which is GM kind of more universal now, but back then it was a universal transmi automatic transmission fluid for GMs. Um, it did not have a lot of the uh, lubricant requirements that Honda had in their own power steering fluid. And Honda power steering fluid was not really any more expensive than any other brand. It's just that they didn't happen to have any at their home, and so they put in whatever they had. And then, well, guess what? Now your power steering pump is ruined. And uh, that's going to be a little bit more expensive. <laughs> I, than... I like when people go, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Think back. Yep. <laughs> think back. So right. it really does. It makes a difference. All right. The next one we're going to talk about is uh, removing a battery cable to check to see if your alternator is charging or not. And we're going to do that right after this. On our list today, we are talking about things that you should never do to your car. One of those things used to be true. You used to be able to pull your negative battery cable off of the battery, and if the car continued running, then the alternator was good. Right. And if the car died, then you knew that it wasn't charging. However, and I don't even need to go to the copy on this one from the article. I can tell you that with today's charging systems in the car, with all of the extra power for technology that's also involved, yep. air conditioning, running this, that, the other thing. Computers. Yes, onboard computers. Yep. If you do that, Skippy, you are asking for a shit ton of problems. Yeah. I am not kidding. Do not, on cars from 1990, and upwards, do not do that. Do not remove the negative battery cable. That is not true in today's cars. At one time it was, but not for today's cars. Well, you know, and back in the day, uh, a 7027 alternator was about a 40 amp alternator. Mm -hmm. 40 amp alternator would not be enough to keep a modern car running. Not even close. They're all minimum about 120 amps. And you know what? Those ones that we're talking about, were about this big. Right. Today's they're about this big. Right. They're smaller, but yeah. they are way more efficient. Yep. Uh, and they spin more easily, and they're they're just a lot better alternator. But holy cow, yeah, don't don't do that anymore. You're going to cause a huge spike that is likely going to blow a fuse. Yeah, don't do that, Skippy. Okay, this one, and I know people do it. Don't drive when your oil light is on. <laughs> I, that's a warning light. Yeah, they call them idiot lights for a reason. <laughs> the 707. Yeah, Isn't that 707, what it is? 710. 710. The 710 light. Yeah. Uh, all cars have a low oil pressure warning light. Mm -hmm. If the light comes on while you're driving, it can mean that your car is dangerously low or completely out of oil. Uh, or it can mean that your car has a serious leak that's causing a pressure drop, a clogged oil passage that's causing oil starvation, or the oil pump has failed mm. or is failing. That is catastrophic. Which is, yeah, your your engine is short for this world. Uh, whatever the cause, when the light comes on, pull off the road immediately and shut off the engine. Pop the hood and check that the uh, oil level is on the dipstick. And if the dipstick shows you're out of oil or dangerously low, you have to add more oil before you continue. I mean, this seems like a no-brainer, but... And you say to yourself, well, I could make it to the local automotive oh, store. Oh, no. 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 No, and, and, and it doesn't get better. It won't. And no. And it only can get worse. Next up, 
Never drive with less than a quarter of a tank of gas. Ronnie, when you told me a couple of weeks back that when your tank gets to about halfway, you're off to the gas station. Yeah, I fill up once a week. Yep. And and I I don't drive that much, and I have a couple cars, so I don't always drive my truck that much. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just fill up on Saturdays, and very rarely am I below a quarter of a tank. All right, well, here's the situation why that's so important. Uh, today's fuel pumps are located in the back of the car, usually underneath the, the back seat. And um, the fuel pump is built into the gas tank itself. Right. And what happens is as the gas goes down as you're burning it, it exposes more and more of the fuel pump that's inside of the tank. The gas, in essence, is what cools the fuel pump so that if you're running your car down to less than, or let's just say to the light, right? Uh, what's happening is your fuel pump is pumping inside your gas tank, but it's getting very, very hot. Yep. And it will withstand it for a while, but not forever. So what they're saying here in this article is, don't let your tank go down below a quarter, all right? Yep. Uh, next, never use the wrong oil in your car. Explain. So, uh, car makers have had to up their game on engine design to meet higher mileage standards. Newer engines are built to more exacting tolerances and include high-tech mechanisms like variable valve timing yeah. and turbochargers to squeeze more and more miles and gallons out of every gallon of gas. Um, the, uh, the variable valve timing systems work by pulsing pressurized oil into hydraulic passages to advance or slow the camshaft. The pulse timing and associated camshaft movement is based on the oil type and viscosity listed in your owner's manual. There's that word again. Owner's manual. The computer varies the pulse rate based on the en engine temperature and driver inputs from the accelerator pedal. It all works great if you use the right oil and it gets messed up if you use the wrong oil. In fact, using the wrong viscosity oil can actually set a trouble code or uh, engine light, mm -hmm. uh, what do they call them, CEL, check engine light, right. uh, on your dash. So again, and I use Mobile One, which is what my full owner's synthetic. manual calls for. Full synthetic. Full synthetic oil. Uh, in my Corvette, that's what, right in the owner's manual, that's what it calls for. And you'll see some numbers or actually letters on there like uh, C, E, C, F, C, G, and the older the car is, it may be like a, if you have an owner's manual for my 69 Camaro, it probably says C, B, or C, C. Well, and they keep upping the grades of the oil. So you can use more modern oil, but you can't use less modern oil, And but the viscosity is what's really important on modern engines. Yeah. On older engines, you used to be able to, once they bur start burning a little oil, maybe Put a little thicker, thicker stuff in there. Yeah. Remember that 50 weight? Exactly. Used to run that on my pickup. Yep. Uh, let's see. One other comment. Oh, uh, go by, if it says it on your oil cap nowadays, not many cars have this, but a lot of times it'll say right there on the cap, use 10W30 oil yep. or synthetic oil or something like that. So if that's on your cap, use that. Yep. Just use that. Now, the caveat to this with viscosity is it can be temperature based depending on where you are geographically. True. Yeah, they would use something completely different in Alaska right. than they would use down in Las Vegas. Right. Okay. Never use dishwashing detergent to wash your car. Such a big mistake. You know what? In, instead of going on and on about this, I'm going to say don't do it. Go to your auto parts store and buy car wash and um, avoid being one of those cars that you see that drives down the road with the clear coat just peeling off of yep. the car. That is a direct result. You can take my word for it. Dishwashing liquid takes wax, everything, mm -hmm. right off of the paint. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you have no protection once you do that. Never neglect the dipstick, Ron. Oh, yeah. That's what I tell my wife all the time. It's a different show, though. <laughs> it's a different show. Yeah. Okay. The, the oil change intervals listed in your owner's <laughs> manual are based on your car's maker assumption that you'll not only use the recommended oil, but that you'll also check the oil on a regular basis and top it off when it's low. All engines use some oil uh, between oil changes 
Even new engines can burn as much as a quart every 1,500 to 3,000 miles. If you never check your dipstick, you'll never know if you need to add more oil. Worse yet, if you don't top off your oil, you stress the remaining oil, dramatically reducing its useful life. Yeah. Uh, so as an example, let's assume the recommended oil change is every 7,500 miles, which is pretty typical. On my truck, it's 10,000 miles. Yeah, uh, the newer the vehicle, the, the further that the oil is going nowadays. And they're using more synthetics, uh, Right. You know, partial synthetics or full synthetics. If you're uh, honestly, if you're using conventional motor oil, I recommend that you change it every five to seven thousand miles, not three like they used to say. Right. And Ronnie is right. Uh, probably seven to ten. Um, probably uh, I don't know. What would you say? Well, and I know at Honda it was seventy five hundred miles to to ten thousand or twelve. Uh, yeah. I mean, probably ten thousand is. I, I'm a little afraid, honestly, in my truck to take it up there. I, and I, dri I baby my truck. Yeah, I drive it, it like an old lady. Right. So, I mean, the oil that's in there is not, you know, when I look at, the, when I check the oil, it's still pretty golden. So. Well, uh, environmentally speaking. Yeah. The less you change your oil, the less damage you're doing to landfills. Right. And recycling. Uh, I will also tell you that there are motor oils that are manufactured based on recycled right. motor oil as right. well uh, that's a possibility and also let's add that when you do your own oil change and not a lot of people seem to be doing that anymore but um, you can recycle the oil filter yep and you can also recycle the oil all you need to do is have the proper uh, container to transport it and take it to the auto parts store. They have a tank in the back where they'll dump it for you and give you your empty tank back for the next one. And many counties, I know uh, we're in Sacramento County, they will actually accept your oil if you put it into a pl uh, plastic milk jug. Right, with the lid, lid taped on, and then uh, even the oil filter should be in a plastic bag mm -hmm. And they'll take you, just put it right next to your garbage can on Recycle Week. And what a great feeling that is to have changed your own oil and then done what's right for the environment. Yep. So there you have it. There's two guys, two old guys, by the way. Yeah. Sitting around talking about automobiles. Uh, I will mention that if you get a chance, check out my car show on 1015khits.com. Uh, go to the website there. On the website, you'll see a drop-down menu that says Hosts, and there's a free podcast when you click on my picture there on the website. Okay, you check those out. Um, thanks for watching today. We hope that you learned something. Uh, we love automobiles. We have for years. Oh, boy. We used to have classic cars, which weren't even classics at that no, time, Ryan. Not the time. But they, <laughs> they were to us. Yep. And, uh, and nowadays, if we only had those cars... Well, there's one right there. I, oh, yeah. My 69 Camaro is yep. right, right there. Yep. I had a 68 Firebird. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Love that car. It was root beer brown. It was the color of root beer marbles. marbles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All right. Uh, like the show. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We have another Fen episode coming up next Friday. And also wanted to let you know that uh, keep watching for details because we are going to go... First time live streaming Ooh. coming up very shortly. Scary. We'll keep you posted on the information on how you can be a part of that. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm Lou Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. Thanks for watching today. This has been Minnesota. Minnesota <laughs> Thanks for watching. The <laughs> <laughs> we are slow. Thanks for watching. Men are so smart today.